Today, in our discussion of minority groups, we have with us two guests. One is Minister Malcolm X. Shabazz, one of the top leaders of the Nation of Islam, or the so-called Black Muslims. And we also have Mr. Herman Blake, uh, one of the teaching assistants in the course. Uh, we will discuss today some of the, the goals and some of the strategies of the Nation of Islam. And I wonder if Mr. Blake might start it off by asking um, Mr. Shabazz a question. Uh, Minister Malcolm, the thing that I thought might be good for starting it off is to talk about one of the most pervasive beliefs in the general society about the Nation of Islam, and that is that it is an organization dedicated to the use of violent means to attain its goals. The question I have is, how true is this, and why do you think it persists in society? Well, the, the Muslims who have accepted the religion of Islam and follow the religious guidance of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad have never bombed any churches, have never murdered any little girls, as was done in Birmingham, have never lynched anybody, have never at any time been guilty of initiating any aggressive acts of violence during the entire uh, 33 years or more that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad has been teaching us. The charge of violence against us actually stems from the guilt complex that exists in the conscious and subconscious minds of most white people in this country. They know that they've been violent in their brutality against Negroes. And they feel that someday the Negro is going to wake up and try and do unto them as they have done unto, do unto the whites as the whites have done unto us. We aren't a violent group. We do, uh, we are taught by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad to be, to obey the law, to respect everyone who respects us. We're taught to display courtesy, to be polite. But we're also taught that at any time, anyone in any way uh, inflicts or seeks to inflict violence upon us, we are within our religious rights to retaliate in self-defense to the maximum degree of our ability. We never initiate any violence upon anyone. But if anyone attacks us, we reserve the right to defend ourselves. So to accuse us of, of being violent is like accusing a man who is being lynched, who is being hung on a tree, uh, simply because he struggles vigorously against his lyncher. The victim is accused of violence, but the lyncher is never accused of violence. And I only point this out because the various racist groups that are set up in this country by whites and who have actually practiced violence against blacks for 400 years are never associated or identified or made synonymous with the term violence. But whites speak of Muslims almost synonymously with violence. Whenever Muslims are mentioned by them, violence is brought up. But, not, but it's not connected with any other group. This is a sort of a propaganda tactic or what I would call psychological warfare to uh, in some way make uh, the image of the Muslims in this country be a violent image rather than a religious image. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to ask a question in that regard. What's interesting is that uh, members of the Nation of Islam have not used violence even when uh, black Americans were attacked. Uh, how do you account for this? D does this in any way contradict uh, some of the basic premises of your movement? I don't know how you mean. Well, you maintain, for example, that, that you will not or that you should not use violence unless you are attacked by the white man. And I think we can note in the last several years, certainly, 
dozens and dozens and dozens of instances in which Negroes have been uh, attacked, uh, killed in some instances. You mean in these demonstrations? These demonstrations and, and the bombings, for example, recently in Birmingham where they killed four little Negro girls. And what interests me is the fact is, is that the Nation of Islam has not done anything to retaliate. I think you should be happy. <laughs> uh, no, that, no, no, the, no, 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 no. The important thing is, does your lack of action no, contradict any no, of your basic principles? I'll explain it. You should be happy that Muslims who follow the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, number one, don't believe in any form of integration and, who be and, and believe that every mention of the word integration by whites, whether it be from the mouth of Kennedy on down to the mouth of the lowest, raggediest white liberal in the street who is beatnik-like involving himself in these integration efforts, if we believed in it, we would integrate and we would fight anybody who got in our way or made any effort whatsoever to stop us from integrating. Mm -hmm. If we really believe that the law of the land, the Supreme Court, and other so-called judicial bodies were for real uh, when they talked about integration, we would integrate. <coughs> and knowing that the law was on our side, and any effort we made to demonstrate toward integration, why, we would know the law should be on our side uh, if it's the law of the land. If it is the law of the land, then the demonstrators are within the law. And the uh, uh, discriminators are against the law. Mm -hmm. But to show you the hypocrisy of the law, when Negroes demonstrate for integration, instead of uh, arresting the discriminators, the law arrests the demonstrators. So this is a foolish move on the part of Negroes. And when you foolishly get yourself involved with a, uh, an enemy, then whatever comes upon you, that's your business. As Muslims, we believe that separation is the best way and the only sensible way, not integration. And, uh, on, but on the other hand, when we see our people being brutalized by white bigots, white racists, uh, we think that they are foolish to allow themselves to be beaten and brutalized and do nothing whatsoever to protect themselves. They are foolish. They, have, if they should have the right to, de to defend themselves against any attack made against them by anyone. If a dog is biting a black man, the black man should kill the dog. Whether the, the dog is a police dog, a hound dog, or any kind of dog. If a dog is sick on a black man, when that black man is doing nothing but trying to uh, take advantage of what the government says is supposed to be his, then that black man should kill that dog or any two-legged dog who sticks the dog on it. Should other black men help that particular person who was attacked? I think you'll find, sir, that there will come a time when black people wake up and become intellectually independent enough to think for themselves, as other humans are intellectually independent enough to think for themselves, then the black man will think like a black man and he will feel for other black people. And this new thinking and feeling will cause black people to stick together. And then at that point, you'll have a situation where when you attack one black man, you are attacking all black men. And this type of black thinking will cause all black people to stick together. And this type of thinking also will bring an end to the brutality inflicted upon black people by white people. And it is the only thing that will bring an end to it. No federal court, state court, or city court will bring an end to it. It's something that the black man has to bring an end to himself. Minister Malcolm, let me, on the basis of your two remarks, ask uh, a, a double-pronged question. One, is it then your assertion that the laws res with respect to how Negroes are supposed to have equal opportunity and equal rights in this country are not meaningful or believed by whites? And secondly, what is then is your opinion and attitude toward the civil rights movement in general, and particularly uh, the Reverend Martin Luther King and his philosophy of nonviolent and direct action? If uh, the white people really passed meaningful laws, 
it would not be necessary to pass any more laws. There are already enough laws on the law books to protect an American citizen. You only need uh, additional laws when you're dealing with someone who is not regarded as an American citizen. But whites are so hypocritical. They don't want to admit that this black man is not a citizen. Uh, so they classify him as a, a second-class citizen to, uh, to get around uh, making him a real citizen. If he was a real citizen, you'd need no more laws. You'd need no civil rights legislation. Uh, civil rights, uh, when you have civil rights, you have citizenship. It's automatic. White people don't need laws to protect their citizenship because they're citizens. But they, want, they, uh, they don't want to tell us we're not citizens. And at the same time, they don't want to pass laws that are meaningful enough to protect us as if we were citizens. And the Supreme Court desegregation decision is the best example I know. That's a law from the Supreme Court. Ten years have gone by. No, no desegregated schools. The, it hasn't been implemented beyond, I think, 9% in ten years. So this just shows you the hypocrisy of the American white man. They talk out of both sides of their mouth. And uh, for this reason, we who are Muslims, that is, who believe in the religion of Islam, who believe in God, we don't believe that black people will ever get any laws, get any problem with laws being passed or uh, new persons being put in office, uh, white liberals being put in office. There is nothing that the white man will ever do to bring about uh, true, sincere uh, citizenship or civil rights recognition for black people in this country. Nothing will they ever do. They will always talk it, but they won't practice it. And uh, with the Supreme Court, if the NAACP can tell me that they want a desegregation decision for me uh, 10 years ago, but yet the schools haven't been desegregated, as I say, this is a victory with no victory. Uh, it's a victory that you can talk about, but it's a victory you can't show me. So if you represent the NAACP and you are telling me about this great victory you won for me, when I look at you, I have to uh, conclude that either you have been duped yourself or else you are trying to dupe me. And in most instance, instances where the civil rights struggle is involved, there is no civil rights leader can point to me one concrete gain, practical gain, that black people have made in the civil rights field in this country, not only during the past 10 years, but during the past 100 years. Now, the other part was uh, with respect to Mr. King and the nonviolent direct action. Well, I will let uh, uh, Jimmy Baldwin and John Killens and Lou Lomax, the writers, answer that. Uh, uh, speaking right after these, th this church was bombed, in Birmingham, Christian church was bombed in Birmingham by Christians too, mind you. And these four little girls were murdered. Uh, John Killens and James Baldwin and uh, Lomax and the Negro writers and actors had a meeting at the town hall in New York. And Killen pointed out concerning these murders of these little girls said, the killings had raised doubts about the intelligence of the nonviolent, uh, of nonviolence in the civil rights struggle. He went on to declare that he could no longer be asked to love those who persecuted and killed Negroes. He also, uh, and the writer, uh, Mr. Handler, who's, who's uh, describing this, said that Killens, it was not clear concerning Killens, Killens' remarks to his audience that he was breaking with the, it was clear, rather, to his audience that he was breaking with the doctrine of the Reverend Martin Luther King's uh, uh, philosophy that as Christians, Negroes should love their fellow man in a truly religious sense. Now, James Baldwin, speaking on that same platform, said, and I was present during this entire affair, asserted that the American people shared a collective guilt for the persecution of Negroes, much as Germans did because of their silence during the Nazi persecution. He denounced President Kennedy for what he termed Kennedy's lack of passion in the civil rights struggle. Mr. Baldwin said that there could no longer be a Republican Party for the Negro people as long as it listed a Barry Goldwater, nor a Democratic Party for the Negro people with a Senator Eastland on its roster. He asserted that the federal government acted swiftly and energetically, that unless the federal government acted swiftly and energetically, future slaughter would make Birmingham look like a dress rehearsal. I, and now, how, what do I think about uh, King's uh, attitude? 
King's right-hand man, uh, Wyatt Walker, at King's convention, according to the New York Times on September the 26th, said, we had, quote, we have been duped, meaning these persons involved in the civil rights struggle, of which King is the symbolic leader. His right-hand man says, and I quote, we have been duped, or have duped ourselves, into believing that the chains have been broken, when in truth we have only been chained more securely. Half freedom has in many instances been worse than no freedom at all. Why, don't ask me what I think about their struggle. I can tell you what they think about their struggle. And, they've have, and they are, are, are pointing out that it is becoming more difficult every day uh, for the civil rights leaders to keep the masses of black people uh, nonviolent and uh, long-suffering and patient and keep them from becoming disenchanted. I hope that answers your question. Well, now there's a new party uh, which has started on the East Coast called the Freedom Now Party, an all-black organization. Would you comment upon this and also upon the possibility that the Nation of Islam might begin to turn some of its attention to the political arena in view of the fact that it is in the political arena that uh, Negroes have not been able to in any way get justice as has been pointed out in your previous statement. I'm not familiar with the Freedom Now Party. I'm not too familiar with politics, period, only that in the sense that uh, white politicians have usually been very hypocritical uh, where the so-called Negroes are concerned. Uh, so I'm a bit disenchanted uh, with politicians and politics. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad is a religious man and his teaching is religious and his solutions are religious. Uh, the Freedom Now Party, from what I understand, is headed by a man named, a lawyer named Conrad Lynn. Mm -hmm. I know him, <coughs> he probably means well. Uh, uh, before passing an opinion on what it is he's trying to do, I would like to uh, analyze it and see who's subsidizing him, see who his friends are, especially who his white friends are. Uh, and after uh, a careful analysis, if I could conclude that uh, there was no uh, white support, I would be inclined to have confidence in it. But if I saw him leaning too heavily upon his white liberal friends for support, then I'd be suspicious of that too. The Muslims, in my opinion, uh, represent an all-black party. Uh, and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad pointed out at uh, before 10,000 in Philadelphia on uh, September the 29th, uh, at a rally that we were having, that in 1964, the black people should band together and do something about electing, uh, selecting and electing uh, representatives, black representatives, politically, uh, who have the uh, rights and the, uh, the best interests of the black people at heart. And that we should also unite together and sweep out of office all of the black political puppets who are used by the white power structure to continue white supremacy uh, in our communities. In that regard, would you include um, Congressman Dawson, for example, from Chicago, and some of the people who represent him on the Chicago City Council? In which regard? Uh, in, in, the, in the area of acting as a puppet. I don't know what Mr. Muhammad's opinion is of Congressman Dawson. They both live right there in the city of Chicago together. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what his uh, opinion is of Congressman uh, Dawson. Uh, I'm suspicious of any Negro, be he politician, uh, be he clergyman, or civic leader who is constantly patted on the back by whites. I have a tendency to lead toward the Negro politician who is constantly condemned by the white power structure. Uh, this is my thought pattern. I'm giving you an insight of it. You, uh, though, mentioned Mr. Lynn and saying you'd like to know who his white friends are. Now, I'm wondering if you didn't make a contradictory statement in Muslim terms by using white and friend in the same phrase. That is I to use say, friend in quotes. I see. In other words, if a, if a black man cannot have a white man as a friend. He may have a white man who's friendly, but being friendly and being a friend, I think, are two different things. I think there are many whites who act friendly toward Negroes. A fox acts, acts friendly toward the lamb. And usually the fox is the one who ends up with the lamb chop on his plate. Mm -hmm. The wolf doesn't act friendly, and therefore the <coughs> wolf has more difficulty in getting the lamb chop in his plate. 
I'd like to point out, though, that... And I, I, I say that because it is usually the, if you study the structure of the Negro community, mm -hmm. economically, politically, civically, psychologically, and otherwise, it's controlled by the white liberal, mm -hmm. who usually poses as the friend of the Negro, who actually differs from the white conservative in, in the same way that the fox differs from the wolf. Uh, their appetite is the same. Their motives are the same. It's only their mannerisms and, and methods that differ. Mm -hmm. I would agree that uh, no doubt there have been a large number of, of whites who have posed as liberals and as friends of the Negro and who have time and again betrayed the Negro. Uh, on the other hand, I think one could point to a large number of whites uh, who have struggled for civil rights, Give me for equality, example. and have got little or nothing out of it uh, <laughs> other than uh, quite a few bruises. Give me an example. Well, the, the large number of, of white uh, students who have gone into the South, for example, working for SNCC and other organizations. Not working for SNCC or other organizations, but working for uh, the white uh, political machines who benefit by the voting uh, efforts of Negroes. Okay. I'll be more specific. Uh, I would cite Herbert Hill, for example, as, an, <laughs> as, as a kind of person who has uh, championed Negro job rights, for example, uh, in New York City and elsewhere. He has fought the political machine. First time I met Herbert Hill personally was when they were picketing to stop the working on the uh, Harlem Hospital in Harlem. Negroes for 10 years had to fight the city to get uh, an annex built on the Harlem Hospital. Because in Harlem we need a hospital more so than anything else. Our people are sick, plus we do a lot of cutting and shooting of each other, though we profess to be nonviolent. And uh, Herbert Hill brought his forces out and stopped the working on that site. Uh, this is the first time I ever saw him. Then uh, when work was brought to a halt on a hospital in Harlem, the same Negroes tried to stop the work at the downstate uh, medical center in Brooklyn, which is predominantly white. They, they were out there for three months during the summer, couldn't stop anything. And I never saw Herbert Hill out there one time. Now, whenever something, whenever it takes uh, a stoppage of something that's going to affect the white man, you find the white liberal absent. But it, when it uh, involves something that primarily will affect the best interests of black people and black people only, then that white liberal is present. Herbert Hill is the labor secretary for the NAACP. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, if he was interested in black people, he would prepare a black man with the type of knowledge and understanding of the labor troubles involving black people that would enable uh, a black man to sit in the same position as Secretary of Labor or Labor Secretary in the NAACP. I'm suspicious of whites who join Negroes and always have to be in the lead, who always have to be the head, who always have to be at the top in Negro organizations. Those whites who really have the interest of blacks at heart, let them give some advice to some Negroes and stand on the sideline. But don't join the organization and then get at the head of it and pose as a friend of Negroes. Well, I, I would uh, defend his sincerity and his commitment. And more than that, I would say that just because a person is a Negro or a black American does not mean that he's going to struggle for, for Negro rights or for, or for jobs for Negroes or anything else. I think that today you could point to a large number of, of Negro leaders who have consistently betrayed Negroes in a whole host of areas. They aren't really Negro leaders. These are puppets that have been put in front of the Negro community by white liberals. These are parrots that have been put in front of the Negro community by white liberals. You can't name me a Negro leader who has been a Negro leader who has been betray, who has betrayed Negroes, who is not who has not been endorsed, sanctioned, uh, subsidized, and supported by the white liberals. Minister Malcolm, I'd like to well, I'd like to cite one example would be Congressman Dawson, for example, in Chicago. And in, in Chicago, a large number of liberals located in the Hyde Park District have consistently fought Dawson and his betrayals of the Negro, and they've also fought some of the people who represent Dawson on the Chicago City Council. The only Negro I know who is constantly fought, only Negro politician that I know who is constantly fought by white liberals is Adam Clayton Powell. And they call him a racist because he speaks so bluntly on the race issue. Uh, but I'm not, as I said, not too familiar with Dawson and his work. Let me, let me return uh, to the Nation of Islam, per se, Minister, by raising a question which uh, struck me as a result of reading some of Baldwin's work, namely The Fire Next Time. 
Baldwin pointed out that in Harlem for many years he had passed the street corners and the soap boxes and heard people speaking from these platforms who were known as black nationalists and nobody was listening. And he said all of a sudden he realized that people were beginning to listen to the Muslim speakers on the street corners in Harlem. The message essentially was the same, but it was that now many, many people were listening to what this message was. And you pointed out that uh, the Nation of Islam has been in the uh, picture for about 33 years. What is it, in your judgment, that has caused this tremendous amount of support that the Nation of Islam has garnered in the Negro community in, say, the last 10 years? When you put a seed in the soil, it remains beneath the soil until the season changes. And, and when the season changes, that the seasonal change automatically brings about uh, rather atmospheric conditions, bring about a seasonal change that makes that seed come up or crop grow uh, in its appointed time. And all over this world today, God himself has brought about political uh, changes, a political atmosphere, sociological, social atmosphere, um, economic atmosphere. These economic conditions, these political conditions and social conditions uh, combine to bring about a situation that is making black people in America more receptive, their mind more fertile to the seed of truth that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad has been planting for 30 some years and this is springing up today and causing our people to see and understand now what they couldn't see and understand before. What is the nature of this situation which is making black people more receptive? The, well, you take uh, the, in the past say 15 years how uh, the nations have emerged, dark nations have emerged in, in Africa. Uh, prior to 10 years ago, most Negroes associated or identified Africa with a savage, jungle-like place. And whenever you mentioned the word African in their mind's eye, they could see the image of a, someone running around with a spear, uh, with no language, who'd say ugga bugga boo or buana or something, and uh, who'd be in a jungle running from lions or chasing lions. But then when, uh, after the war, when the United Nations was set up in New York City, uh, black people began to look at uh, uh, men like Tom Mboya, they begin to look at men like uh, Nkrumah, they begin to see men like Lumumba, they begin to see men like Nasser, they begin to see uh, these uh, Belawa and Azikwe who could uh, exchange intellectually with whites on an international level in a political form and hold their own. This made the black people in this country realize that what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad had been teaching all the time actually had substance. And they began to turn it over in their mind and see that what he was saying had more weight to it than what these other uh, Negroes were saying. And they began to identify themselves with the black world and the black struggle more uh, closely than they identified themselves with this so-called white world. Let me ask you a question with respect to a statement which Essien Udom quotes as being on a bulletin board in the University of Islam in Chicago by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. According to Essien, Mr. Muhammad states, up you mighty race, you can accomplish what you willed. Build your future on these foundations, freedom, justice, and equality. What is the definition of freedom, justice, and equality for the black man and where and when is it to be attained? Well, take equality first. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad doesn't teach us to uh, associate equality with whites. Equality has nothing to do with whites. We, want e we don't want to be equal with the white man. He's not the criteria or yardstick by which equality is measured. He's not in a position to tell us we are equal. It's not his right, it's not his to do. Equality, we want equality. We had equality before the white man was created. We had, the, we had equality before the white man came into existence. And we want equality whether the white man is on this earth or not. Equality means the uh, opportunity to develop all of our dormant potential, all, all of our dormant capability. And, and, and uh, in developing this 
dormant uh, capability, the right and the ability to stand on this earth on some land uh, of our own and bring about a civilization and a society in, we will, in which we will be completely independent, complete freedom to uh, uh, take care of the needs, to take care of the uh, wants and the likes and the dislikes of our people, to establish our own nation, our own society, our own heaven, our own future. This is what we mean by freedom, by uh, equality, and justice means uh, as you sow, so shall you reap. If you do wrong, you'll get wrong in return. And if you do right, you'll get right in return. When you're in your own nation, in your own land, you're in a position to get justice. But when you're in another man's country, in another man's land, under another man's flag, and under another man's uh, 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 government, and under another man's court system, you have to look to that other man for justice, and you'll never get it. And Negroes in this country probably are authorities on that. Yeah. To what extent? Does this formulation approach that expounded by Zionists? Uh, they, for example, many Zionists, Zionists maintain they could never expect uh, justice in the Zionist courts and, and the, the courts found in other countries in Eastern Europe and so on. And they decided that it would be wise to establish a separate state in, in Israel. And, there, the, and, there, the, and all of the world powers got together, the white world powers, I should mm -hmm. say, got together and helped all of these white Jews to establish a separate state uh, in the heart of a dark-skinned people's territory. Uh, and if white people can get together and, and, and let other whites, help other whites uh, to establish uh, an independent nation right in the midst of dark-skinned people, and then we see, we don't see where white people should be so much against the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's solution, not of setting up an independent dark nation in a white people's property, but he's asking uh, uh, the opportunity to set up an independent nation in our own, on our own continent. Let us leave America and go back home among our own people on our own land and set up our own independent society. But all he says is that this government, which made us slaves, should supply the transportation for us to get back home and give us all of the machinery and the tools necessary for us to till the soil and establish our own agricultural system to feed and clothe our people, our own economy and in some way become an independent people among our own people on our own continent. This is intelligent, and Zionists should never criticize us. You say then that the United States is not the black man's country. Definitely American not. laws no, are no. not black men's laws. No. So, I, uh, American laws are not the black man's laws. Well, the, the uh, laws here in America were made white by white people for the benefit of white people. The Constitution was written by whites for the benefit of whites. It was never written for the benefit of blacks. And, and when you read the Constitution, I think in Article 1, se Section Article one, Section 2, or Section 1, Article 1, some one of the two, and it's in the Constitution, it says that uh, that classifies black people as three-fifths of a man. Three-fifths of a man, subhuman, less than a human being. It relegates us to the level of cattle, hogs, chickens, cows, a commodity that could be bought and sold at the will of the master. No, it was written by whites for the benefit of whites, and to the detriment of blacks. And when a black man stands up talking about his constitutional rights, he's out of his mind. Now, Minister Malcolm, in our textbook, which the students have read, supposedly, there is a statement, which is a quotation from Essien and essentially that from uh, Lincoln, to the effect that uh, the nation of Islam does not have a great deal of support in the Negro community in this country by and large. And a recent national poll of American Negroes found that leaders and rank and file, according to their statistics, supported the Reverend Martin Luther King somewhere over 90%, whereas the support and favorable rating that they gave Minister Muhammad was less than 20%, and somewhere around 45% of them gave an unfavorable rating to Mr. Muhammad. What would your response be in terms of Baldwin's statement that this is a growing thing and the kinds of evidence that we have that there isn't much to it? Well, uh, that, that statement I made, just made concerning the Constitution is Article 1, Section 2 in the Constitution mm -hmm. where it classifies us as chattel. Uh, Baldwin did point out that Mr. Muhammad has the only grassroots support and is the only one whose whole 
the following operates or functions on a mass vehicle. Uh, and, and I think Baldwin told Dr. Kenneth Clark that uh, Martin Luther King is at the end of his rope. Now, uh, concerning the uh, poll taken by Newsweek magazine, I think you said that this was the leaders who said that, uh, who went with King and against Mr. Muhammad around 90%. I just told you a little while ago, these leaders that they call leaders, this included <laughs> Lena Horne, this included Dick Gregory, and this included comedians, comics, trumpet players, baseball players. Show me in the white community where a comedian is a white leader. Show me in the white community where a singer is a white leader or a dancer or a trumpet player is a white leader. These aren't leaders. These are puppets and clowns that uh, have been set up over the white community and or over the black community by the white community and have been made celebrities and usually say exactly what uh, they know that the white man wants to hear. And it is an honor, actually, that they endorsed Dr. Martin Luther King and uh, uh, were against the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. That's actually an honor. Now, when you say that they also, in this same Newsweek poll magazine, they, I think the pollster said that he went into the Negro community and asked about the Muslims. And many Negroes whom he asked said, well, I never heard of the Muslims. Who are they? You know, this, this is the rank and file we're talking about. Oh, yeah. About. Now, yeah. when they got down to the rank and file, this was the answers that they got. Uh, this is equivalent to uh, the situation in Kenya during the Mau Mau uprising when many uh, frightened uh, whites in Kenya, Africa, would go among the Africans and ask them, what about the Mau Mau? And the African would say, I never heard of them. And the same white man who would ask the African this question and very naively believe what the African said, when he went to bed that night, he would lose his head. And usually the one who took his head was the same African who told him that afternoon he had never heard of the Mau Mau. Uh, except uh, in the Newsweek poll, they used Negro interviewers. You'll find that oftentimes Negroes are as much on guard uh, around Negro interviewers who usually represent the bourgeois uh, element of Negroes as they are on guard around whites. Uh, usually Negroes know that when this bourgeois Negro walks through the door, he is not doing something that he's initiated himself, but he's involved in something in which the white man is the absolute author of and has sent him to the Negro community for some information. And when they give that Negro some information, usually they give him the information that they want, the white, want him to take back to the white man, because that's who he's going to take it back to. Four more minutes. Uh, our time is just about up, Minister Malcolm, and uh, perhaps you could summarize and conclude by giving us, in your opinion, or in the opinion of Mr. Elijah Muhammad, what would be the ideal solution to the racial problem in the United States today? Well, on Thursday, October the 3rd, the New York Tribune, in an editorial, pointed out in Boston, in an article called The Civil Rights Iceberg, they pointed out how Kennedy had realized that beneath the water, the civil rights uh, whole problem uh, was political suicide. Because in his own hometown, the head of the Board of Education, a woman named Mrs. Uh, Hicks, was running against the NAACP philosophy, and she swept aside all other opposition. The whole white community supported her in opposition to the NAACP's desire for integrated schools, integrated housing, and otherwise. So I say that to say this, that even the Jewish community, community which is supposed to be pro-liberal, went against the NAACP. Whites are against integration in practice, but they're for it in principle. So the only solution is separation. And the Honorable Elijah Muhammad says that this can be brought about simply by letting our people be exposed to the truth about ourselves, about the white man, about our history and our condition in this country. And once we are exposed to the complete truth as things, about things as they actually exist in this country, the masses of black people will choose complete separation from this entire system, political system, economic system, social system, and whatever other aspect or description you, or, or, or uh, uh, adjective you want to attach to it. Let us go back home to our own people, live among our own kind, and solve our own problems ourselves. And if the white man doesn't want us to go back to our own people and live in our own country, then since we can't get along together in peace on this country with white people, 
Let a separate part of this continent migrate to that separate territory. Let the government give us everything we need to establish our own independent economic system and society, and thereby we'll be able to solve our own problems ourselves and prove that we are human beings and a part of the human family and can do for ourselves what other humans have done for themselves. And then we'll be able to stop blaming the white man for what he has done and stop begging the white man to solve our problems. We'll be able to solve our problems ourselves. Thank you very much. That's it.